If you're a football fan, even a casual one, then you 100% know the name Ray Lewis. Maybe for no other reason than his iconic touchdown celebration dance. During his 17-year career as a middle linebacker in the NFL, he was consistently one of the league's most beloved players due to his hard-hitting, aggressive playstyle as well as his leadership abilities, being well known for his rousing before-game locker room speeches. Even though he stands at just 6'1", during the course of his legendary Hall of Fame career, he would go on to set the record for most tackles in NFL history, win the Defensive Player of the Year award twice, be named to the Pro Bowl 13 times, and lead his team, the Baltimore Ravens, to two Super Bowl victories, in one of which he was named Super Bowl MVP only the second time in history that a linebacker has won this honor. Today, Ray Lewis is remembered as one of the greatest football players of all time and is widely regarded as the greatest player to ever put on a Baltimore Ravens jersey, with a statue immortalizing him right in front of the entrance to the Ravens MNT Bank Stadium. However, this first ballot Hall of Fame career almost never happened, as on January 31st, 2000, during an afterparty for the recently completed Super Bowl 34, an incident would occur that would forever stain the legacy of Ray Lewis, and that was he was a witness, and some say a participant, in a double murder that took place during the early morning at around 3 a.m. Lewis and two of his friends would eventually be arrested by police and charged with murder, with what happens next still casting a cloud of suspicion over the otherwise pristine reputation of Ray Lewis. Ray Lewis, birth name Raymond Anthony Jenkins, was born in 1975 to a 15-year-old mother in Bartow a small city in central Florida, and would eventually become the eldest of five siblings. After Ray's birth, his mother desperately needed help paying for her hospital bills, and so with nowhere else to turn, she called a friend of hers who was in the army named Ray Lewis, and asked him to come to the hospital and sign as the father on the birth certificate. He agreed and said that it was his privilege to help out in this small way, but since he was in the army, he wouldn't be able to stick around. At the time, Ray's biological father, a 20-year-old man by the name of Elbert Whitehead, was currently in prison for drug charges. Elbert didn't know he was a father, and would only find out nine months later when he was released. Shortly after meeting his son for the first time, Elbert abandoned the family as at the time he was heavily addicted to drugs and also had impregnated two other women. And despite working in a meat packing factory at the time, he also refused to pay child support, leaving the family on their own and forcing Ray's mother to have to work three different jobs to support them. Sometimes, Elbert would call the family and tell them that he was coming to pick up Ray so they could spend time together. So Ray would pack up a suitcase and wait outside for his father to arrive. But despite living just 20 miles away, he never showed up, leaving a heartbroken Ray all alone on the side of the road. With no father figure in the household, Ray had to grow up fast so he could help out his mother which he did so by helping his sisters with their hair and making sure everyone arrived at school and extracurriculars on time. When he entered high school, Ray officially changed his name to Ray Lewis to honor the man who had helped out his mother in her time of need. At school, Ray became involved in sports and joined both the football and wrestling teams. His coaches frequently praised him for his skill and athleticism, but Ray felt these comments to be bittersweet as he had no father figure to share his achievements with. One time in a bid to motivate Ray, his high school wrestling coach gave him their school's 1975 yearbook and told him, quote, you'll know what to do with this. The yearbook included the school's athletic records and as Ray looked through it, he realized that his father held all of the school's wrestling records. Ray described his reaction to seeing this in a later interview by saying, quote, 
I'm gonna go through these books and I'm gonna train so hard that I will never stop until his name is erased. Every time his record would fall, I would go into my garage and scratch off, throw it away and say, that's one down. Ray became a high school sports star and a local celebrity in his small city. And one day in the mailbox, legal papers from Elbert showed up. Elbert had hired a lawyer and had legally changed Ray's name to Elbert Ray Jackson Jr. without informing anyone else. Ray was enraged and would write in his 2016 memoir, quote, My mother showed the papers to me and I went off. Really, I was furious. I marched those documents out of the house, like the papers themselves could pollute the air, infect our lives with the stink of this man who left us for nothing. With tears in his eyes, he took the papers outside to burn them, telling his mother, quote, I'm gonna burn these papers, mama. I will never live a day in that man's name. His mother then silently put her hand on his back and watched as he burned the papers. Ray would go on to break all of the records previously held by his father, and became an all-state linebacker as well as his school's first all-state wrestling champion. In 1993, he accepted a scholarship to play football for the University of Miami, where he continued to break records and catch the eyes of scouts. In the 1996 NFL Draft, Ray was selected in the first round at number 26 by the Baltimore Ravens. Even though three other linebackers were chosen ahead of him, by just his second year he led the NFL in tackles. Frequently, his father would reappear in his life and pretend like he wanted to reconnect and then he would ask for money and disappear once again. But despite this, Ray's life could not have been going better. He was one of the most popular and successful NFL players at 24 years old with a $26 million contract, and he was also a new father. But this string of good fortune would take a turn for the worse one night in January of 2000. Ray had been in Atlanta, Georgia to watch Super Bowl 34 between the St. Louis Rams and the Tennessee Titans and had booked himself into the luxury Georgian Hotel. Despite being well regarded as one of the most exciting Super Bowls ever, the event would become largely overshadowed by the following events that night. After the game was over, Ray and some friends decided to go out partying in Atlanta's bar-filled Buckhead district. Ray also brought along his personal chauffeur, Dwayne Fawcett, and rented a 37-foot-long Lincoln Navigator, which had 14 seats and cost around $3,000 a day. That night, Ray dressed to the nines and wore a black and white suit along with a full-length mink coat. His date for the night was not his pregnant fiance, but instead a woman named Jessica Robertson, whom he had met a few nights earlier at a party hosted by NBA legend Magic Johnson. Ray and his crew then headed for the luxurious Cobalt Lounge for a night of partying. Amongst his entourage at the club was Joseph Sweeting, a strip club promoter who'd been friends with Ray since college, and Reginald Oakley, who had recently become acquainted with Ray through Friends of Friends. The three had went shopping together the day before, where Ray had spent over $100,000 on jewelry while Joseph and Reginald had purchased two folding knives from a sporting goods store. After drinking four Remy Martin cognacs, Ray and his entourage of about 10 people left the club at around 3.30 a.m. While outside, Reginald got into a verbal argument with two other clubbers, who were also part of a large group of around 10 people. The argument escalated until Reginald was smashed on the side of the head by a champagne bottle. A large fight then broke out that included everyone in both groups. Everyone, that is, except for Ray Lewis, as he would later testify in court that as the melee began, he tried to break up the fight, and when he realized it wasn't going to happen, he calmly walked away from the fight and rested on his limo, even as he saw his friend Joseph get beat up and dragged away by two men. Eventually, the fight broke up when it became clear that two young men were bleeding out on the side of the street from stab wounds. 
The two men were 24-year-old Richard Lawler and 21-year-old Jacinth Baker. Richard had worked as a barber and was hoping to save up enough money to open up his own barber shop one day so he could better provide for his pregnant fiance. While Jacinth was a promising artist and had hoped to one day attend art school. In the aftermath of the skirmish, both men lay dying from stab wounds to the heart which caused Ray to scream at his crew to follow him and run into the limo so they could make their getaway. As they drove off into the night, several gunshots were fired at the fleeing limo by members of the other group. The limo drove not to the luxury Georgian hotel where Ray was staying, but instead to the Holiday Inn Express where Joseph had booked a room. In the parking lot, Ray reportedly yelled at the group, quote, Everyone just shut the fuck up. This ain't going to come back on nobody but me. Ray then took a cab back to his hotel, where in his room he lamented to a friend about how this incident was going to destroy his career. Atlanta homicide detectives then arrived at the crime scene to begin their investigation. While there, they discovered a small folding knife on the ground near one of the bodies. Forensic tests would later show no signs of blood or fingerprints on the knife. Investigators also spoke to numerous witnesses. One of them told police that they had seen someone exit the limo and dump a white laundry bag into a dumpster outside of a fast food restaurant. Another witness would claim they saw the limo stop and someone exit it carrying a brown paper bag before disposing of it in the trash. Prosecutors would later claim in court that the brown paper bag contained Ray's blood-stained white suit which along with the clothes worn by Reginald and Joseph that night have never been found. Police then went in the direction that witnesses had told them the limo drove off in, and it didn't take them long before they stumbled across the limo parked outside the Holiday Inn. Upon opening the limo doors, they discovered that it was covered in blood and had several bullet holes. One of the tires had also been shot. In the Holiday Inn lobby, police found the limo driver Dwayne Fawcett, who was chain smoking and shaking so badly that he was spilling coffee all over himself. He told investigators that Ray Lewis was the renter of the limo and that he had seen Reginald, Joseph, and Ray all throwing punches at the victims. He also claimed that he had overheard Reginald say, I stab mine, to which Charles replied, I stab mine too. He also ominously told police, quote, I ain't got no reason to be afraid of Ray. Ray would never hurt me. But them other two? I don't know. I don't know what they might do. He also told them where Ray was staying, but by the time police got to his hotel room, he was long gone, and the room had been cleared of all of Ray's belongings, all except for a forgotten travel itinerary that told them the hotel where Reginald was staying. There they spoke with a clerk who told them that just a couple of hours after the stabbings, a man wearing oversized clothes and who had a cut on his hand showed up at the front desk. The man seemed to be in a hurry and wanted to quickly check out of the hotel, but not before asking the clerk to change his name on the registration from Reginald Oakley to his real name, which he said was Joseph Sweeting. Meanwhile, detectives learned that the real Joseph Sweeting was somewhere in Miami, and were surprised to learn that Miami police were very familiar with Joseph, as he was a prime suspect in several unsolved murders and was also suspected to be a member of a gang known as the Untouchables, who would dress up as women and rob jewelry stores. Police were also able to trace the knife found at the scene to a sports store where the night before, Ray had been signing autographs. They also found several witnesses who claimed that Joseph Sweeting was the man who purchased the knife. Police also tracked down Ray, who had fled to his fiancé's house. During their interview, Ray lied several times to police. First, he denied he was ever at the scene in the first place. He then said that he didn't know the names of any of the people who rode in his limo, before clarifying that he only knew Charles. He also originally denied knowing that Charles's head had been cut, but later in the conversation acknowledged that Charles's head had been quote, busted open. He then refused to sign the statement, 
as he claimed that it was more important for him to get ready to fly to Hawaii to compete in that year's Pro Bowl. This conversation made police instantly suspicious, and so on January 31st, Ray was arrested and would later be indicted by a grand jury on two counts of malice murder, felony murder, and aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Ray cried at the news and would later say in an ESPN interview, quote, I wept. I wept when my five-year-old son asked me why daddy was always on TV wearing chains. I wept myself to sleep some nights on that nasty bed in that nasty cell. Despite Joseph's whereabouts still being unknown to police, Ray was able to relay several messages to him through his sister and Joseph's girlfriend. In one of the messages, Ray reportedly told Joseph that he had no reason to worry as Ray would never turn him in or betray him. Ray would spend 15 days in jail before his lawyer could get him out on a $1 million bond. The next week, both Joseph and Reginald turned themselves into police, which their attorneys claimed was evidence of their innocence. With the Baltimore Ravens owner, Art Modell, frantically calling around for attorneys, police discovered that just two hours after the murder, Ray had called his girlfriend Jessica Robertson and told her to go to his hotel room and pack up his belongings. Police were confident that they had a strong case. They had several eyewitnesses to the crime, including their star witness, Dwayne the Limo Driver, whose claim of seeing Joseph and Charles punching the two victims in the stomach was consistent with the medical examiner's opinion that a small blade was used and it was likely concealed in the perpetrator's hands so when they made a fist, the blade poked out between their fingers. Before the trial began, Ray was offered a plea deal where he would plead guilty to aggravated assault and testify against Charles and Reginald, but this was declined after Ray learned he would have to serve three years in prison, which would bring his NFL career to an end. What was initially a strong case quickly fell apart as the trial began. Most of the prosecution's witnesses would recant their statements. The limo driver completely changed his story and now said he never saw Ray hit anyone, but instead tried to break up the fight several times. His story also had several inconsistencies, which he blamed on lapses in memory and hearing loss due to old age. The prosecutor would later blame the case falling apart on people being reluctant to send a high-profile celebrity to jail. It was also later revealed that Ray had hired several private detectives who were able to get to 11 out of 12 witnesses before police were. The victims' families have alleged that the witnesses had been bribed in order to ensure Ray was acquitted. No witness for the prosecution was able to identify Ray as being a part of the brawl. The medical examiner testified that they were unable to identify who the blood on the knife and in the limo belonged to. With their case falling apart, the prosecution then offered Ray another deal. They would drop the murder charges in exchange for him testifying against Joseph and Charles, which Ray instantly agreed to. As part of his plea deal, Ray had to plead guilty to obstruction of justice for telling people in his limo to keep quiet and not talk to anyone. Ray took the stand and described how he had seen Joseph and Charles buy knives the night before and how he saw them punch people in the fight. Ray also claimed that the night after the killings, Charles had described to him in detail how the night before he had killed someone with a knife. Despite this, however, the case still fell apart and after less than six hours of deliberations, the jury ruled that the killings had been done in self-defense and so both Charles and Reginald were acquitted and released from jail. Ironically, the only person who was punished in any way was Ray, who was sentenced to a year of probation as part of his plea deal and was also fined $250,000 by the NFL. Civil suits were brought against Ray by the victim's families, which were settled out of court for an undisclosed sum that is believed to be in the millions. Ray's career never suffered as a result of the trial, as just the next year he would go on to lead the Baltimore Ravens to their first ever Super Bowl victory, where Ray was also awarded the title of Super Bowl MVP. 
Today, Ray Lewis is widely regarded as one of the greatest football players of all time, and he frequently makes appearances on NFL broadcasts to offer commentary. Ever since the murders, Ray has largely portrayed himself to be a hapless victim of circumstance who was targeted by police due to his wealth, saying in 2001, quote, Yeah, I've got money. Yeah, I'm black. Yeah, I'm blessed. But let's find out the real truth. The real truth is that it was never about those two kids who were dead in the street. It's about Ray Lewis, and that's what this is about. That's not right for nobody. Don't get mad at me because I was on center stage. The people to be mad at are the prosecutor and the mayor of Atlanta. They never cared one time to find out who killed these people. They said, we're going to get Ray Lewis, and Ray Lewis was never the guy. Thank you for watching, and if you have any suggestions on a future video, please leave it in the comments below. Thank you, and I will see you next time.